the Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press, what is the average death count attributed to each journalist? Okay, hey everybody, I'm Randy Critical. This is Randy Critical Live on the Fly with a very special Assange Countdown to Freedom here uh, on 99.5 FM in New York City. Uh, it's on WBAI.org. Uh, it is on YouTube. It's on uh, Rockfin and it's on Twitter. It's all over the place. It's the first time we've used this kind of software, which is StreamYard. Uh, and it's the first time I've done a show this ambitious, but you know the story, what happened today uh, in London, uh, Julian Assange uh, was um, the high court sided with the Biden administration and uh, they want to send him back. And we have such a powerful show with a lot of great guests on. Uh, coming on, we have, um, we have Nils Melzer. He and I planned this a few weeks back and we have John Pilger coming on soon, I believe, if he's there. Um, we have um, we have Roger Waters. Uh, we're going to probably go to him first because John is not in yet. And uh, Angela Richter is going to join us uh, a little later on. Uh, Craig Murray, who just drove like a thousand miles just out of prison to London. And uh, he's in London uh, right now and he hasn't slept, but we're going to get to him uh, real soon. Uh, and uh, Daniel Ellsberg is going to be joining us if he hasn't already. Uh, but I think Roger is with us right now. I, I may as well just go to Roger as we're waiting for John. Uh, Roger, are you uh, with us? Yeah. All right. Watch uh, the language today because we're on live radio. Sprung this on me. I, uh, no, I, I was expecting to turn on and listen to John for talking for a bit and blow it. No, up. well, John, no, well, I didn't mean to spring it on you. I can just continue talking or put up a, a, a clip. But since you're there and the people are dropping in, anybody out there who hasn't dropped in, please do. This is all ad lib today. It's extemporized uh, because uh, we've never done this. We, you know, Roger, you and I and uh, you're Neil, splitting and, half, mate. Am I really? Yes, yeah, better. How's that? Good. Look, the bloody dog shed all over me. This is typical, isn't it? Yes, it really is typical. Anyway, I got to look into the camera here. Um, so I'll just lean back. And yeah. um, like I said, we're on WBAI uh, 99.5 FM. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, Rockfin. And uh, today, I, I know that you uh, got the news early, uh, Roger, about uh, what happened uh, to. Um, Julian, and it, it's crushing. It is uh, really, uh, I'm very it's melancholy. black day. Hey, you got to be careful with the language. Yes. What did you say? I said it's a black day. Oh, it's a black day. I yes, can't help smiling because I always do when I see your face. But um, it's What's no black blacker than yesterday was, and it's probably no blacker than tomorrow will be. But it's too black for us to live with for the rest of time. You know, yeah. it, it's so disgusting. Disgusting. In um, that's it. I've said it all now. That's it. I, I understand that. 
I understand that, but uh, you've been on this for a long time. You've been uh, out there. I saw you marching in uh, D.C., not D.C., London, uh, last uh, February 22nd, 2020. Uh, and then later on, you uh, you led a uh, protest where you were singing, um, I Wish You Were Here. And you've done this show many times. You've done a lot of shows. You've been on Fox. You've been on uh, a million programs. And so uh, you've been on this. Uh, I mean, this... What did you, what did you expect this today? I mean, we're both cynical. Yeah, you did. Well, look at the look at the prick who's the judge. I mean, the Lord Chief Justice of whatnot. I actually looked him up a bit today, just to see whether he's a class traitor like I would be if I was doing his job, or whether he actually went to Eton before he went to Oxford. I think he's. I think he's a grammar school boy. So he's not actually one of them. He's become one of them. They get people to join the elite by giving them knighthoods and calling them the Lord Chief Justice of here, there, or there. Uh, um, and clearly, clearly, none of this has anything to do with justice. Clearly, right? Nothing to. It does have to do with law, though. If the law is meant to be a tool in the hands of the ruling elite in order to keep the rest of us subjugated and under their, there it is, thumb, and because that is what is going on, and that's what Lord, whatever his bloody name is, is uh, you know, did this morning, and it was entirely predictable. Uh, in my view, I'm concerned about what happens next. I mean, I was reading what our friend John, who, who who's apparently sick somewhere, I'm told. So maybe uh, maybe we well, won't. He's not, he's, uh, yes, John will be joining us in a second because. All right. Well, when he does, just when he does cut me off because I can talk later. I read what he was writing this morning and I, I, I don't have the text in front of me, but it was something about how this is an absolute capitulation to fascism. It's just like saying, oh, why doesn't the world just become completely fascist and not care about any of the progress that we've made since the Dark Ages? You know? Yes. And he's I right. Mean, of well, course. who do you know this guy? Um, his name is Alan Duncan, Sir Alan Duncan. Did, did you read about him? Who's this reactionary? Yeah, sure. Yes, Lord. Is he a Lord or a Sir? But yeah, uh, he called Julian a little worm when he was locked, when he was not locked up, but when he was living, when he was, had taken refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy. Yeah. And he said he thought that the little worm should be dragged out and shot, more or less. He didn't actually say shot, but he said. Yeah. Uh, and and he was the one who is quoted as saying that he couldn't help smirking when Assange, when Julian was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy eventually. Yeah. So yeah. don't yeah, you know don't get me started on Alan on, on these people. But you, look, you've been critical of all of these people in high places in, in the British establishment, uh, whether it be uh, Tony Blair, uh, Jack Straw. Uh, what is it that makes these guys run? Why are they, uh, what makes them be so evil? I mean, I'm just trying to come up with some ideas here. I mean, because I can't figure it out, how people can be this uh, evil. But, well, it's either money or power, both of which are addictive. They're, they're the sort of oxycontin of these people's lives is either money or power. And, and the two are often inextricably entwined, in my view. I, I, don't, I, I can't see any other reason why they would behave like they do. Yeah. They've, they, they've, they've taken on board this idea that the, the organization of the human race on this planet is a sort of game that can be won and lost, you know, and that they want to be on the winning side. And the winning side means having power and having money. And living comfortably and f everybody else. I, you told me not to swear a minute uh, earlier. Well, you? it's hard not to swear on a day like today. But we yeah. have a good guy in the studio, Reggie Johnson, who's a master engineer that could that can catch anything uh, with his eyes closed. Uh, so if if you happen to have a slip, uh, it, it's uh, it's okay because we're all furious. Uh, we're all fuming about this, even though, as Nils Melzer, who'll be joining us at the top of the hour, will tell you uh, that uh, he expected this, he predicted it uh, just a few weeks back, that this 
is exactly what was going to happen. We were wishing against hope. The, the, uh, they're sticking it in our face. They're, they're flouting the law, and now they're flaunting flouting the law. Is if what you are a person, Randy, who has feelings, it's hard to put yourself in the place of and imagine what it'd be like to be a effing rhinoceros. They don't, they don't feel anything, these people. They're so thick-skinned, and they lie with a consummate ease. And so this bloke who calls himself the Lord Chief Justice of, the, of England or whatever, or whatever it is he calls himself has no, in, zero interest in the idea of justice or whether something's right or wrong. No interest in that. He's, he's, fulfilling, he's fulfilling a role in a charade. This particular charade is a kangaroo court taking place in the high court in London, and it has nothing to do with anything except him doing his master's bidding. And his masters are politicians in Washington, D.C., via Boris Johnson, who works for them. He is their poodle. And so is the Lord Chief Justice, because you only have to eat, you only have to be able to read simple English to understand that this is what they're doing is completely against the law. Yes. And so you know what? for them to go, well, the law says blah, 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 and he can be extradited and locked up in a box in Colorado. But the right place for him, obviously, but that's the law. Right. No, it isn't. The law says you can't be extradited for a political reason, for instance. Well, what if this is? It's not political. What has Julian Assange done? Criticized and publicized the fact that the United States of America has committed war crimes. Yes. That's what he's best known for. The collateral, let's be let's call a spade a spade. The collateral murder video, that is why they're locking him up. Because well, uh, right now is a good time to expand on that. Uh, we finally have uh, the, the greatest journalist of uh, my lifetime on the uh, on board with us right now, uh, the redoubtable uh, John Pilger, who started this series with Julian. Assange's Countdown to Freedom, exactly five years ago. And John, thank you for joining us. Can you hear us okay, John? You got it? He's see this speaking very quiet. You can see his name up there. I don't know. John, turn your microphone on if you can. Um, we have uh, Daniel Ellsberg standing by here as well. Uh, but we got John. If John can hear us, uh, please uh, chime in. Uh, uh, Kelly, uh, can you uh, put, put up the sound? If not, uh, I'm going to go to Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel, are you still there? Yes, I am here now. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We're, Daniel Ellsberg, the, the great whistleblower, uh, is, uh, the most famous whistleblower, I suppose. He's the one who kicked it all off back in 71. Uh, thank you for coming back. You're on with Roger Waters. And, John is there somewhere. Uh, oh, his sound is turned off. I see. Uh, he's got to turn his sound on. Uh, and so um, maybe, Kelly, you can send him an email. Say, turn sound on. We're on w WBAA 99.5 FM in New York City. We're on YouTube. We're on Rockfin. We're on Twitter. We're with Roger Waters. Now, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, quick, be, while we're waiting for John, maybe you can pipe in here and tell us about your initial thoughts uh, on today's ruling. The fact that I understand, I read in the paper today, this is UN Human Rights Day, and uh, as well as the second day, unless it's over now, of a supposed virtual summit that Biden is leading on democracy. And uh, I was looking up the word chutzpah to see if it was right for Biden to be talking about democracy or human rights on this day, or whether there was too much of a euphemism. It is described as arrogant self-assurance, mock, almost mocking uh, other people. But the um, uh, right of 
Julian Assange very specifically not to be in communicado for 10 years, 11 years now, years in solitary confinement for having told the truth about U.S. government criminality, a right that Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken are absolutely denying him at this point by uh, trying to extradite him to isolation in this country and keep him in isolation in the UK, for him not to be hooted down at this summit. Granted that, that there are people in the summit like the Congo and some others that uh, uh, probably uh, are not offended uh, by this at all. But uh, the fact is that to talk about democracy and human rights in a context where you are trying to extradite Julian Assange to this country uh, is a mockery. Yeah. Uh, it is a violation. This is from that's a universal human right in our country. Unlike Britain, where he's being held, we have a First Amendment, and it's a blatant violation of the First Amendment. I was even thinking of the fact that that uh, uh, the British court is helping the the, the uh, judges there now who just uh, called for the uh, extradition right. of Julian Assange are. Helping Long Biden, shanks. helping Biden uh, rescind the First Amendment, which we think of as one of the great fruits of our American Revolution, our War of Independence. In a way, Britain. It just occurred to me this morning. Britain is being helped. Is helping Biden reverse the the best benefits of the War of Independence. They have an official Secrets Act. We don't. We have a First Amendment which they don't. And the reason we have it is that we broke off from the British Empire. Uh, first, uh, an official secrets act is something that no empire can do without. And uh, Britain uh, has as a vestige of its imperial glory, has an official secrets act, essentially censorship of what any journalist can say about what it's doing abroad to other people in the way of torture, exploitation, imprisonment, murder, death squads, whatever. Yes. Most, most humans aren't, aren't really eager to hear that their government is doing that, unless it's an enemy they've been taught needs to be exterminated. Uh, so governments need to keep that secret, what they're doing. Empires. Empires need to keep it secret. Empire, by definition, is a nation that is ruling other nations without their consent. That's the, the, virtually the definition of empire. Well, we do that informally. The British used to do it very formally and informally. And for that, you need, to, you need to keep secrets. And Biden is determined now, it would seem, uh, like Trump, who brought this, brought this uh, indictment, to get away from the First Amendment and say, yes, the government will decide what you hear about what we're doing in the way of murder, torture, overthrowing democratic governments, and whatnot. All right. I am, I am a, uh, I'm a uh, American citizen who would prefer to stay with the First Amendment, and that puts me in resistance to my own government now. Me too. I feel exactly the same. And we've, th th that was really well said, uh, really beautiful what you just said, um, and educational. Thank you, uh, Dan. We're going to go now to John Pilger, who's been fighting against empire for uh, many decades. And John, thank you for uh, joining us today. Good seeing you. You could be you could be muted, John. You could be muted. There's a button there to unmute. Is there, there's some there's a a mute button there. It's when you find it, uh, just touch it and uh, yell at me. I see it muted now. I see it. It says mute, mute. So you got to unmute it. Still coming. Uh, well, as. We, this is Randy Credit or Randy Credit Live on the Fly on 99.5 FM uh, with uh, Roger Waters, with Daniel Ellsberg, soon uh, Craig Murray. But right now we're just uh, trying to get the uh, sound. Uh, yeah, John and right. I are Luddites, basically, and that this kind of uh, technology uh, throws me off. I had a problem getting no, it. Randy, Randy, can yeah. I make a suggestion? I had trouble getting on this because you, you hadn't told us that it had to be on Chrome. And I was on Safari, and I couldn't get on it with your Steamyard technology. So well, it may be that John needs to get onto Chrome, as I finally did. All right. Well, he can certainly hear you. 
Uh, I, I will um, uh, continue this discussion. Uh, what do you say about this, um, Roger, as we're waiting for John uh, to uh, find that, that little button? That You're right. Maybe he has to go to Chrome. But be patient, John. We're going to get you in here. Uh, Roger, as to the uh, Official Secrecies Act vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment, uh, does it well, really well, matter? Well, I, I'm, I was very interested to hear Daniel uh, uh, describing those differences between uh, the law in um, the United States of America and the law in England and the fact that they don't have an official secret sector. I, I, I didn't know that. This is That is not a great area of expertise for me, but I'm really interested to hear it. But when he was talking about that, you know, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, maybe we, we, we do have an official secret sector, but... You, we also had all that bullshit on the banks of the Buddy River Thames in Runnymede in twelve, you know, whenever it was, and 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 the art and those articles were ratified at the end of that century, twelve ninety something or other. You know that no man shall be uh, have his liberty taken away from him, save that he is tried by a a jury of his peers and blah, 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 blah. All that was agreed with King John and the barons. And uh, Well, that's all been thrown out now. Habeas corpus no longer seems to matter. Oh, he's unmuted himself. Well, it, it no, but it's still, we still can't hear you, John. Oh, uh, well. Yeah, yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Louder. You can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hey. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're a bit quiet. A little quiet? Bit. Yeah. Hang shout! On. I've got to turn right up. Okay. I'm going to shout. Well, we can hear you. We can. We can hear you very well. Okay. Very nice to see you. <laughs> Randy, what have you given me here? Well, you're fine. We can hear you just fine, John. Don't do anything else. You're perfect. Yeah. I I gave you, uh, you know, a... Uh, you didn't a give me chat. a break. I, yeah, I, anyway... So, John, uh, your thoughts about today? Well, Roger has said it eloquently and powerfully at the beginning, and so has Dan. I perhaps don't share Dan's faith in the First Amendment. I think they've torn that up a long time ago. And uh, I think the Espionage Act <coughs> is uh, another version of the Official Secrets Act in this country and so where is where is the constitution getting julian now it won't get him anywhere once they get him on that plane uh he'll be lost um so i think it is about it is about voices now it is about direct action i mean the judges took nine minutes today nine minutes of contemptuous dismissal of any form of justice. And they came down as the only reason for uh, extraditing Julian were these assurances that uh, once in American custody, Julian wouldn't be subject to, you know, Sam's a special administrative measure, measures which can in effect, make him an unperson, that he wouldn't end up in uh, the ADX Florence, which human rights groups and jurists for years have been describing as illegal, and that maybe we'll even let him go to Australia. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure they don't know about this in Australia because they're so collusive in the whole thing that uh, <coughs> that that uh, they wouldn't. But Look, uh, American assurances, assurances since 1945, government after government has had assurances. Um, what did what did um, what, what did they say? They they said that this would be. I'm paraphrasing it now. This would be an assurance between the government of. The United Kingdom and the government of the USA, as if, I mean, either this this pair of bewigged couriers from the establishment are, uh, are, are, are suffering terminal naivety, which I doubt, uh, 
or they know damn well that uh, the uh, that that uh, um, that that assurances between governments, particularly between imperial governments, whose whole currency is lying. Look at the way empires have been established in our time, established on lies, on duplicity. And here is Julian being the victim of that same imperial lying and duplicity. Um, it's because this case is so rarely talked about in wider political terms, in understanding how the world is run, that it's run and ordered by great imperial powers and they will do as they want to do. And they're doing what they want to do in this court case. While the, the barristers run through the finer points of law with them and treat them with respect. But here are these two guys turn up today in nine minutes, dismiss all the arguments of some of the most distinguished people in the world that had studied and diagnosed Julian as suffering from Asperger's and autism. And I was in court in the Old Bailey when, uh, uh, when, when, when uh, the evidence that Julian had tried to uh, self-harm and perhaps even take his own life, when a razor blade was found in his cell, uh, when he was perpetually calling the Samaritans and had written farewell letters, this, this terrible evidence, this terrible evidence was completely ignored today. And the fact that even... I think one, I'm, on the, I'm on the air now. Uh, I'll, uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, yeah, you could make the... Uh, Dan, Dan's on the phone. Yeah. But go I, ahead, I'm John. Get off here. I'm, I'm on the air now. Yeah, yeah a good sandwich would be I'm good. Right, I'm trying yeah, no, no one in the Go ahead, John. Continue. And Craig, sit down. We are next. Can, so you can hear me, can you? I'm yes, I can hear you perfectly. <laughs> okay. We anyway. saw Craig. This is listen, John. This is uh, a shakedown cruise for me. Having this many people on, <laughs> using it. there's John. Craig is next. Sit down, Craig, and uh, John continue. <laughs> yeah, it was a grotesque showing today. Uh, it will get no publicity, right up to right up to uh, when the court convened at 10.15, there was no publicity. And of course, people apart from those who uh, look to those of us on social media will know nothing about it. Uh, the Guardian, the Guardian today announced its, its awards to its various people, including one person who abused Julian Assange for years. How ironic and on Human Rights Day. Yeah. All, yeah. All, 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 these, all these are part of the whole network of, of true oppression against this man. Um, and I think it's now left to as many people as we can, can bring together to speak up for Julian. And there were thousands of people. When I was last at the Royal Court of Justice, they sat, they sat down on the strand and the police didn't dare lift them. There are thousands of people outside the court uh, then, perhaps I don't know about today, but there is a great body of ordinary people who support Julian, who understand, increasingly understand what the issues are. Yeah. Somehow we have to make that a touchstone uh, to make this into a movement because I don't see any other way. Perhaps, perhaps there is going to be a um, an appeal that might succeed. I don't know. Uh, thank you, John Pilger. We're talking to John Pilger, Roger Waters, Daniel Ellsberg uh, here on WBAI 99.5 FM and on YouTube, Rokefin, Twitter. And now we are joined by someone who was actually there, three days out of uh, being a, a political prisoner, 
Craig Murray rushed to London last night, got there this morning, hasn't slept. So, Craig, uh, tell us, um, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can uh, hear you. Can you hear me? Your, okay. thoughts, your thoughts today, uh, you were on BBC for about a minute today. I was surprised uh, that that's all the coverage they gave. Oh. They cut you off. Yeah, yeah, I'm, um, I'm slightly worried, but whoever didn't cut me off quite quickly enough has been sacked at the BBC since, um, since I... Um, I, I got that minute on. No, I mean, today was was farcical. Um, nobody knew it was happening until four o'clock yesterday afternoon. Um, I got a message uh, late yesterday afternoon asking if I could get here. And I, I, I dashed down overnight. The, I mean, one, one fascinating thing is that the judges told the lawyers not to turn up. The, the judge just said this is being held without counsel because they won't accept any submissions and, and the, you know, the defense team would not be allowed to say anything. So Julian wasn't in the court or present by video link and his legal team uh, were supposed not to be present uh, in the court, although Gareth Pierce decided to ignore um, the uh, instruction not to turn up. And, 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 and did arrive to um, uh, show support and, and to consult on on next steps. Um, and the bland um, statement from the judge who said that, you know, the assurances by the United States government constitute a solemn undertaking by one sovereign state to another <laughs> and therefore have to be accepted. Um, as though states never abuse human rights uh, and states never break their their word whereas in fact of course by definition it is states who are the largest um abusers of human rights it, it was extremely um frustrating to be in that court and 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 and, and, and to see it uh, and the you know the bland assure the the unmitigated acceptance that anything the United States government says must be true by, by the court. Um, and the failure by the court to address at all, I, either in court today or in the written judgment, the question of the many cases in the past where the United States government has given such assurances and broken them, um, what was very, very hard to take. It, it, it was difficult. The, the judge himself was um, smug would I think be, you know, once you've actually issued an instruction before you start, but, you know, lawyers aren't wanted and nobody else is going to be allowed to speak, I guess you get to be smug because nobody else is going to be allowed to say anything. Um, uh, Wait, was the Lord Chief Justice there or was it just Holroyd? No, just Holroyd, the Lord Chief Justice Holroyd. didn't show. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, it was only, it was, it was only Holroyd. Um, we had a, um, uh, you know, we were able uh, to meet with Julian's legal team afterwards, and Julian's counsel was able to speak to him in the prison about the next steps, and then we were able to take it forward. Um, the situation now becomes entangled in, um, in farce, really, because we have until the 23rd of December to lodge an appeal to the Supreme Court against this decision, um, which would prevent Beretza from going ahead and acting as instructed. And remember, Beretza wasn't told to look at this again. She was told to cancel her, uh, uh, her order and accept the diplomatic assurances and order the extradition of Julian Assange and refer it to the Home Secretary. Um, but we we have until the 23rd of December to um, uh, to launch an appeal to the Supreme Court against today's decision. Um, that will then the Supreme Court will then decide whether or not to hear that appeal. Um, should that appeal be unsuccessful, it, it and we could be talking six months away here, another six months of Julian in Belmarsh. Uh, even possibly longer. Um, it then goes back to Bates in the magistrate's court to order the extradition. At that point, 
we get to counter appeal again to the High Court, to the same judges today, on the other points, on the um, point of freedom of speech, on the no political extradition point, on the point of the CIA involvement, the attempts to assassinate, or on the point of the uh, the witness who was um, bribed to, to uh, lie in Iceland. So we have to conclude right up to the Supreme Court the hearing on the US government's points of appeal before we can initiate the hearing on our points of appeal. So, um, uh, and, and again, I mean, this could easily be another two to three years before this um, extradition is is resolved, all of which time Julian is dying effectively, uh, being destroyed in these conditions in, in Belmarsh. So it's by no means the end of anything today in terms of legal process, but unless a, um, a political decision is taken in London or Washington or both to end this persecution, um, the process is going to succeed uh, in destroying Julian, however the process ends up in the end. Uh, uh, and that, of course, is the is the enormous worry. But the um, uh, just the, the sheer hypocrisy of the whole thing and the failure of the court to acknowledge in any way that this is about freedom of speech, this is about war crimes, this is about the murder of, of innocents. Um, uh, you know, ju just the, the way the court divorced itself from, from all of that w w was really was really sickening to see. Yeah. Anybody have a question for Craig since he was there today, John or Roger or anybody? Well, I have a question, yeah. And it and it follows on from what John was saying uh, uh, earlier a few minutes ago just before Craig arrived, which was he was he was saying, "Where do we go from here?" And he he was suggesting direct action of some kind. So it it so it demands that we ask ourselves the question, are we many or not? Or are we only a few? Are we a handful of people? Or are there really millions of us who are not prepared to stomach this uh, kangaroo court and this complete charade and disregard for human rights and the law and everything else? I don't know the answer to that question. We know that the propaganda is extremely powerful you know, about about Julian Assange particularly. But what is the direct action, John, that you would suggest? I'll stop talking because Niels is yeah. here as well and Stefania. So I want to hear what they have to say too. But John. Um, well, I think that's the only thing left. Um, how many times do we have to go down the establishment routes? This today should have taught us that you can't do that anymore. They All they do is treat you with contempt as this Judge Holroyd today, speaking on behalf of the, two of the most senior judges in Britain, treated his audience, the lawyers, and especially Julian, with contempt. They're also saying, look, we know we have coerced you. We have conquered your intellect your heart. We're on top now, but they're not. I know they're not. Uh, many people are disorientated. There's no question about that. But Julian has an enormous groundswell of support across the world, and especially in this country. So I think it comes down, not just to us, but to those of us who can speak out. I mean, I give, for example, when Niels has joined us, Niels's contribution to Julian's freedom is just extraordinary because he has, in using his, his analytical powers and using his understanding and of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of the law, of international law and so on, has translated this for... Most people, those of us, those who are prepared to listen uh, and listening to Nils, listening to you, Roger, listening to all of you and Dan, um, people understand 
it's to get the audience. Where are they? How do we get the audience? Roger, you've got command of certain audience, of a certain audience, and you use that most effectively. You use it in great presentations. You speak to your audience. But that has to be the way. I just don't see... I mean, the, the, this appeal, this appeal nonsense that Craig has so well described will work its way. But as Craig says, Julian will die. He will die. He will die standing up. I mean, you know, he faces a living death in the United States. But he's alone tonight in his cell in Belmarsh. Can you imagine? Imagine what the guy is feeling. It's just right. uh, I, I, now he's got, if as Craig says, and I've no reason to doubt it, he's got several years ahead. Then where is that going to go? I asked Gareth Pierce, his lawyer, about about this. I said, "What if it goes against you?" This is some time ago, and she said, "We'll keep them in the courts till the end of time." Now she said it in a very positive way that they'll never get him in the US. But till the end of time in Belmarsh uh, is not far from being in Florence, in Colorado, or wherever these monstrous institutions are. So I think it's a people's movement now. And we that's another discussion that we have to move on. And it's a wider discussion. Um, yeah. But it's quite specific in a way because it's about Julia. I have to say, I think the campaign so far has been rather misguided in saying that about a free press, that it's much wider than Julia. It's about a free press. What free press? It's about real journalism. It's about justice. There is no free press. The Guardian, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they're not free. None of them are free. And I don't give a damn if they're, if someone came and collared one of them tomorrow. It's not going to happen. They're safe. They're all safe. It is about the kind of journalism Craig's and Neil's and Roger's that appears as a kind of Samazan uh, and Stefania's wonderful in investigation and use of the system. It's a Samazan that we've created. Um, when I say we, rather arrogantly, I mean the many who have created that. That's what we have to use. We have to use that power, and it is a power, it is a power to get through to a wider audience. But we have to walk away from this institutional manipulation to which we're all drawn. We had to be drawn today. It was such a decisive moment. But from here on, uh, let them get on with what they have to do. But the more urgent thing is to rally the people. I totally agree. And, you know, I want to thank the station WBAI uh, for the last six years has covered this story. The only place you can hear it is on the Pacifica Network on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, you were one of the first. Craig was one of the first. Uh, Niels has been on many times. And then Stefani, you mentioned I'm going to go to Stefani first. Uh, she has a book out coming out uh, very soon in English, I believe. And then we'll go to Niels. So let's, I, I hope everybody can stay because this is important. This inspires people out there and uh, they need uh, to hear your voices. Stefani. Yes, Randy, thank you. Thanks <clears throat> for inviting me. So, uh, Randy, you have to realize that I had no, I mean, I, I had no shock because I don't expect any justice from the British system, from the US system, as I never expected justice from the Swedish system after fighting in the Swedish court for my freedom of information. Uh, case. I mean, I have been, I have been fighting to get access to this documentation for almost seven years, and we are now heading to fifty thousand euros of legal bills, just the legal fees for this, 
for this case. And, you know, four governments are trying to stop my access. And the UK Crown Prosecution Service is resisting all my attempts. The US State Department is resisting all my attempts. The Swedish prosecution, the Swedish auto, uh, prosecution authorities is resisting all my attempts. Scotland Yard is resisting all my attempts. The Department of uh, Foreign Affairs in Australia is resisting all my attempts. So they are do they are using all the legal resources against the journalists completely alone, fighting for getting access to these documentations. It means that these documents contain something like dynamite. You know, they 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 contain something really really important. So I, I have no, you know, I have no trust whatsoever in the judicial system. And I think we should not expect the next judicial appeal uh, open for something. We have to take the street. We have to take, you know, we have to enforce this network of people who really cover the case, who really understand what it's at stake. I really want him alive because uh, they are win they are winning, you know. Whatever it happens, and he remains in prison, and he can commit suicide anytime. He, they want him completely broken, you know. Yeah, we're talking with uh, some wonderful guests here: Roger Waters, John Pilger, Daniel Ellsberg, Craig Murray, uh, Stefani Morici, and joining us right now. Uh, patiently uh, there, who predicted the, today's outcome on this show a couple of weeks back, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, Niels Melzer. Uh, I, you were not you were not surprised. You told me this morning, Niels. No, I was not surprised. I mean, I I was surprised to hear that it was going to be today. Today, I remind you, is the International Day of Human Rights, the tenth of December the day when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. I mean, seriously, it's, it's the top of cynicism to have this appeals judgment, you know, supported by the Chief Justice of, the, of, of England and England and Wales that runs counter to the basic notion of what human rights is really about. I mean, it's the negation of human rights that what we see today happening at, at the High Court. And uh, no, I was not surprised. Uh, well, let's, uh, Dan, we haven't heard from you. You you were not surprised uh, either, Dan. And then we'll go to Craig after that. Uh, so people, please uh, stay, stay around. We need you. Uh, Dan? You know, I find I'm uneasy here to be disagreeing with John Pilger on anything because he's a hero of mine and a journalistic model and a hero. But uh, I think there are probably rather few Britishers who are aware of what Roger, as Roger was saying, that there is a difference, in fact, in American jurisprudence on this point and on the constitutional issue. Uh, namely, there's no question at all I, I'm not surprised that Judge Barrett, sir, for instance, didn't recognize any problem raised about the constitutional issue here in the U.S. Because what could she know about it? Is she an expert on American law? I doubt if she does know actually much difference or other Britishers. She could only address this case from the point of view of a British judge. And uh, with the awareness of British law, there would be no question of uh, Julian's guilt under the Official Secrets Act. There would be no case to be made, including me. The same would be true. In America, I was the first to be prosecuted for giving information to Americans. Since uh, almost 200 years had gone by, including World War I and World War II, without anyone being uh, imprisoned for that. The Sedition Act in seven, 1917 is a, is a different matter. It's an amendment to the Espionage Act, which uh, uh, dropped after 1921. I was the first then in 1971 to be tried under this. And if it had come to the Supreme Court then, I would almost surely have had the Espionage Act revoked. 
uh, for unconstitutionality in this application. To a non-espionage case, they didn't claim it was an espionage case. In fact, the prosecutor didn't want the jury to think it was ridiculous to call me a spy. He actually made a motion that the word espionage act or espionage should not be mentioned in the courtroom. And the judge accepted that motion. So here I was being tried, as John says correctly, as if the Espionage Act were an official secrets act. But was that on a clear constitutional standing? And the answer is flatly no. Now, if I may say, John, the uh, from listening to you uh, on this, and I agree, obviously, with most of what you say, but on this point, one would infer that nothing significant or different or novel or ominous had happened today. It's all been done in the past. There's no free speech. There's no uh, uh, First Amendment and so forth that makes any difference. That's wrong, actually. Something did ha has happened in this case with the indictment under Trump. Remember that Obama, when Biden was vice president, but he didn't agree with it, Biden called when he was vice president, that Assange was a high-tech terrorist, which is ridiculous, obviously, on its face. But he called him it. But Obama, Justice Department, did not prosecute uh, Julian. And as a matter of fact, neither did George W. Bush. Uh, and, and the 2010, 2013, we're talking about when these alleged offenses occurred, Bush didn't prosecute him. Why not? Uh, Obama prosecuted eight people in the way that I've been prosecuted as sources. And as I say, there's a strong constitutional case against that, against prosecuting me in America, not in Britain. In this case, sorry to say it, but our law remains better than yours. You well, should not have an official act, and we should not have an act that's used as an official secret act. But the difference is that even Trump, even George W. Bush, uh, and even Obama, I'm sorry, not Trump, even Obama did not prosecute Julian because of the constitutional issue. He's the first journalist to be prosecuted. I was the first source. Since then, there's been a dozen and more. But they still had refrained from prosecuting a journalist, no matter how mad they were. And you know, all governments hate that. The hundred, how many people of the people that are gathered together on that democracy summit there? really sympathize with someone telling their secrets to the press. Right. Is there any any state in the country that really wants, in the nation really wants that? And few of them have something like a First Amendment. But we do. So something has happened here of significance that does call for challenge legally through the media who have been very bad on this issue so far. But I think there is a real chance they will sit up on this one because the first time a bullseye has been put on their backs, a target. Right. It's first time. So I think we do have something left to make of that. And as I say, I don't expect it in Britain because you've lived with this forever. But in America, it's a change. And it's a change we should oppose. Doesn't I mean, Opposing it will not keep us from being an empire, will not keep us from doing war crimes and doing aggression, whatever. But it does give us a chance to tell each other about it that doesn't actually yet exist in Britain. All right, response uh, uh, from you, John, and then we'll go right to Craig. From John to Craig, uh, oh. give us your response to that. I, I uh, Dan, I thought Obama, I mean, Bush didn't prosecute because um, Bush really wasn't interested in prosecuting and it really wasn't up and running then. Obama spoke about the New York Times problem. Now, not a constitutional problem. The that, is, that is the constitutional problem, John. That's the constitutional problem. Yeah, There's no, no I, problem with prosecuting me, but he did eight people on that, but he didn't prosecute a journalist. No right. one had until Trump. And now Biden has joined Trump on that. Right. That is a, a change. Go ahead, John. I think Obama was very keen to have the support of liberal America. And he was very keen to have the support of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and he wasn't going to frighten them. I don't know why Obama actually prosecuted more whistleblowers than any other president ever. Uh, but uh, he chose not to do this one. 
Um, he prosecuted Chelsea Manning. He chose not to. John, I'm saying the same thing. The point is, Biden is. Forget Trump now. Biden is prosecuting. Uh, well, that's and that's bad. Biden that's a change. That's a change. Biden is the heir to Obama in a sort of way. He's disagreeing with Obama's Department of Justice on this. He is disagreeing. He is disagreeing with it. He has disagreed. The Department of Justice decided there was a New York Times problem. Yes, they're journalists, they're publishers, like Julian Assange. So you don't go after them. Uh, do you go or the LA Times or the San Francisco Chronicle? You don't do that. Biden has the same issue. There's no New York Times problem now. It remains true that if if Julian were to go on trial here, where his prospects nowadays would be very bad, I'm sorry to say. But if truly yeah. went on, at least the issue would be raised. Why aren't you doing it to the New York Times? If he is convicted, and he would be, he will not be the last. Right. It will be the New York Times. Right. It will be the posts that go on. And that we might make Americans sit up on. We don't have an official notice issue. What do you call it? You know, essentially censorship uh, before that. We don't have that yet. In other words, bad as our free press is, and they mostly buy in with empire, they are an imperial press in this country. It can get worse. And John, that's my disagreement with you. As if, right. no, it's as bad as it could be now. No, it can get worse. And uh, if, if Julian is convicted, it will be worse. Right. I, I think we all agree with that. Uh, and, and I I agree that uh, with John. Uh, I wouldn't expect uh, not America. I, I got to move it on to um, Craig because Craig is it, it hasn't slept uh, in about thirty six hours. So uh, Craig, um, what what you've heard here, your, your thoughts on, on on this back and forth about the First Amendment? Yeah, I mean, one thing which, which has been very clever is the way the state has handled this because none of those arguments have been heard in in court in the appeals process so so far you know, the today's hearing today's judgment um and the entire appeals process has only been about julian's mental health which is very good for the state because they like to say of course this guy is crazy he's nuts that's why he did the things he did and about prison conditions in the United States, which is slightly difficult ground for them, but nothing that, that worries them specifically. Um, and an appeal to the Supreme Court from today will still only be talking about Julian's mental health and, and, and American prison conditions. It's not until that Supreme Court process is exhausted and possibly even uh, an appeal to Strasbourg initiated after that, is that it, it's not until that line of discussion is uh, is exhausted that the process allows us to go back and launch a, a cross appeal with, with from Beretz's original decision on the points we lost at on the original decision. So all the freedom of speech points with, with, which Daniel raises won't actually be aired in court. And of course, when when those points aren't the points the court is discussing, that makes it even harder to get those points into the public dialogue and into the mainstream media. And, and we could be another year of the legal process um, away before those courts are being um, up, up before those those very important questions are being are being aired in court, um, and uh, you know today I was watching. Um, uh, I've been doing quite a few media interviews. I'm watching the international media uh, myself. My, the worst I saw was um, MSNBC, where the presenter, the actual program of the presenter, was interviewing one of the prosecutors in in, in the United States, and he said to her, uh, and this was the the presenter said. As a prosecutor, how do you go about ensuring that this man who caused the death of American servicemen <laughs> and the death of people who were working with American forces, how do you make sure that your prosecution is successful? <laughs> and that was that was a so-called journalist um, asking a question of a prosecutor, and that uh, that was perhaps the worst I saw. But it's not. A typical. We had one of we had someone from Obama's Justice Department on Sky News this evening, um, arguing that in fact 
um, you don't need the, uh, the, the, the New York Times uh, problem because what really matters is the fact that Julian helped Chelsea Manning to hack. This is about hacking, not about freedom of speech, not about publication. Um, and also it's about the hacking in Iceland, which of course was a, was a load of lies. But the attempt to obfuscate the real issues um, across all the mainstream media is really quite scary because um, the, uh, I've done several interviews, none of which have been broadcast by anybody um, except Russia Today, and like 30 seconds of me live that the BBC uh, streamed outside the courts before they realised what I was saying and cut me off. Um, so getting... And, and the sad truth is um, that no matter how hard we try in the, in, in the new media, if you like, and on the internet, um, getting the message through against the barrage of what people uh, get on the television remains extremely difficult. Uh, and and the, the other thought, I'm mean, I agree absolutely with Roger, but what we need is, a, is an upload. But the, that feeds through into the difficulty that the, the political elite increasingly don't actually care what the people think because the people have no exactly, means exactly. of enforcing what they think upon the political elite. There, there's no one you can vote for who has any chance of winning um, who's ever going to do anything different because those people are kept out of the political system. So you know, th this is a much deeper and more, and, and, and more fundamental point. But no matter how we manage to get through to people and convince people, and I think certainly in the UK at the moment, I think public opinion really has shifted, and there's a very great deal of support for Julian in the UK. But how we manage to mobilise that in a way that makes anybody actually care who is in power is, is well, what are we... because they care about themselves and, and, and their their position, their power, and their money. Mm -hmm. We we can do very little to threaten them, uh, 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 and that that of course is a much wider societal question and, and forgive me you, you, you're right i didn't sleep last night and and i i may be somewhat rambling but but those are my uh my immediate no no you're you're doing great you're all doing great uh this is such a wonderful program uh it's, we're going to go to stefania and then Niels. i'm trying to get everybody uh, equal time here stefania yes i mean <clears throat> would you please ask me a question because i okay I stefania what, what they just said about how difficult is it for you as a journalist uh, to get popular uh, support in, in your own home country of Italy, in my grandparents' home country? Well, actually, pop popular support is quite wide here. Even if the, the politics, our politics is the problem, is completely broken with, uh, beyond any repair. I mean, <laughs> politics, we are in deep troubles. But, I mean, people, there is a word quite a widespread support, I believe. And uh, I have seen how they they interact, uh, they ask the right questions, they they want, they ask, what can I do? I mean, uh, how, what kind of practical help I, can I provide? So at the popular level, I think it's quite uh, good, the situation here. It's the politics. I, I mean, last, last week, our uh, low chamber, voted against uh, providing any support to Julian Assange and the Democratic Party voted with the far right and right and with the right wing, the Democratic, the Italian Democratic Party. We had the, you know, we had a, a magnificent Communist Party in the 70s and now we have this Democratic Party voting with the with the right, with the Berlusconi party, with the Salvini party, with the Renzi party against Julian Assange. And we are in trouble with our politics, but we are not in trouble with people. People are involved, people mobilize, people and the Italian Union of Journalists is completely siding with Julian Assange. So they, today they issued a press release strongly condemning this sentence, this ruling by the uh, British High Court, and that was really positive, you know? Right. Uh, Niels, uh, what's the roadmap that you see forward uh, in 
extricating uh, Julian from this yeah. uh, endless nightmare. Yeah, well, you know, as I've said before, I've not been surprised by what happened today. As you know very well, the last time we talked on your show, I predicted precisely this outcome. And uh, by the way, I predicted it already one day after the judgment of the first instance court on the 4th of January, where I saw that she had reduced the topic, the, the themes that were going to be discussed to precisely the conditions of detention and the state of health of Assange. So what I'm saying, in, in, in my book that's coming out in February in English on the, the trial of Julian Assange, the last chapter I added just recently was on the appeals procedure, and I called it the title of that of that chapter is playing out the plot, because that's really what we're seeing in this case. All along, since his expulsion from the embassy, the latest, and actually already before, it's just a plot that's playing out with a predictability that is scary. It's just like watching a car crash happening in slow motion, and every now and then someone asking you to comment on what you're seeing. Well, it's still a car crash happening in slow motion. We know exactly what's at the end of this. At the end, Julian Assange is crushed as a person and our rights have been, you know, done away with. That's what the purpose of this is because we have a very small and ever smaller powerful elite that concentrates more and more power. And we are still, by and large, the general public is under the illusion that we have functioning democracies governed by the rule of law. And I believe that our jobs, you know, in our various functions, with our various audiences and networks that we have, is to disillusion people. Uh, you know, be gentle enough for them to actually listen to you, but to be clear enough for them to actually be disillusioned. That what well, it's not, you know, yes, it's about Julian Assange, but it's much his case to me is like a keyhole through which you can see a parallel universe that already exists and where our democratic rights and institutions have already been neutralized. You know, it's not like we're going to win this case if Julian Assange is not extradited and we're going to lose it if he's extradited. We've already lost it. If, I mean, Journalists today, if you offer them a USB stick with collateral murder number two and the next 250,000 diplomatic cables, are they going to publish them? No, because they already see what's happening to the people that were involved in those publications. And to Julian, to the, to the whistleblowers, uh, I mean, that's, that's all the, the intimidation, the deterrence is already working. What we need is the courage in the broader public to face the truth, because the truth is uncomfortable and it is complicated. It means we have to change the system. It's not like we can replace one prime minister or one judge or one prosecutor. It's a systemic failure that has evolved over decades. And today, we still believe that we're a democracy because we elect people you know, into parliament every four years. But who is actually financing their campaigns? It's the lobbies. Who is actually writing the legislative pieces for them? It's the lobbies. Those lobbies are private industries that also own most of the media or actually control them through their commercials and marketing, you know, uh, 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 financing and so on. So the media, the, parla and the parliament elects the government and the judges and so on. So by and large, our democratic institutions have already been privatized. So this is just a window dressing exercise, these, these, these ele elections every four years. So we have to, you have to accept that truth and then start from that realization, start changing things. You know, it's not replacing bad people and bringing good people into those positions. It's the whole that will then be corrupted a few years later themselves. You really have to accept that we have a monumental task of putting the spotlight on what the truth really is, how the funk that, that system really works, and the case of Julian Assange is an excellent case illustrating what the reality really is, and then say, this is not the world we want to leave to our children. We really want to change this. Right. Uh, Niels Melzer, 
Randy Critical, Randy Critical, live on the fly, 99.5 FM in New York City, uh, Free Speech Radio. Uh, Roger, I know you wanted to ask John a question. Did, did no, I don't, no, I don't. I want to respond to what Nils has just said. Okay, go ahead. It's what and I was we'll trying start. to get out, and something in my heart was nudged when Stefania mentioned organized labor and said the unions were this and that. How, how do, and we were talking earlier about direct action, which is where we have to go because we are not going to persuade people on MNSBC or Fox News or anything else or VAR, any of those channels. Okay. But how do we get Niels's evident good sense to go viral in a way that will get people to do whatever it is that we haven't said yet in the street. Craig was talking about people outside the high court. There were thousands of them sitting in the street and the police left them alone because it would have caused too much trouble to pick them up and arrest them all and put them in. What is it? What, that's what I was trying to get at earlier because it's quite clear what Neil says is absolutely true what stephanie yeah. says at what john says what it's true everything that we're saying is true how do we light the effing fire and turn it into a conflagration of resistance to what niels has just been describing i mean i'm i'm energized by his talk just well we now. have to can i just say yeah. we we have to start the process the first thing is to discard illusions, to stop banging our heads against the mainstream media, to regard them as the enemy, all of them, unless there are honourable exceptions that can prove they are. But otherwise, you know, this constant, constant effort that is put in by good people to get into the mainstream media, to get a, as Craig mentioned, to get a, a glimpse on the BBC or whatever, that has to go. I think that any direct action has to go to the media. Some I couldn't of the agree with you more. Direct action has gone to the Guardian. Uh, right. And, and uh, 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 it has to go I've always felt this as far as Murdoch's press is concerned. They absolutely hate it. You can, you can do it with few people, but it has to be the kind of creation of a fifth of state. We used to have a fourth of state. Now we need a fifth of state. That is people who understand that there's more to, to our whole journalistic life than a than the so-called mainstream media. Um, and I think many of us have understood that already. But many of us are still indulging it. We have to end those illusions and begin, just to begin. It's a long haul. It always is. But once you begin, there are victories. And there are victories if you, you know where to go, your sources to go. Uh, I mean, the great, the great million people march in 2003, that didn't go anywhere because they didn't keep marching. Uh, it was the most fantastic thing, but they didn't keep marching. Uh, it had no resilience. Um, and th that's... that's as well, I hang on, John. Hang on. So are you suggesting... It, are you suggesting that if you can get that million people to go back to the Plaza de Mayo or wherever, like the Madres de Malvinas did, or the, for the, the mothers of the disappeared, the, they went every effing Thursday, yeah, yeah. For year after year after year. So we need Thursday meetings in squares in, yeah. or what, or something, but and with an idea, with a kernel of an idea broader than the disappeared children of these women who stuck to it and stuck They're to still it. there, by the way. They're still there every Thursday. They actually came to New York City, four of them, and helped us in our movement against New York's racist, draconian Rockefeller drug laws, uh, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo. They are just the best. John, uh, I mean, you believe in direct. I think this is your biggest call 
in a while for direct action. I mean, we did, have we thrown in the towel trying to do this in a conventional way? Well, I, I believe in direct action. I think it is the only way. I think it's it's over. And today should be another uh, clarion call to us. It's over. This is going to go on. Julian is going to suffer in Belmarsh while they go through the whole legal system. But will it will it will it help him? It may. There may something may happen. Let that happen. But yeah. for most of us, most of us, it has to be direct action now. Uh, some people are doing it and are doing it very successfully, but they need allies. They, well, they you know, they need what Percy Shelley said, you know, there are uh, a few of them and many of us. That has to be, that has to be enacted. There are many of us, but we somehow haven't, come together. We came together in that great demonstration. You know, there are lessons to learn. Look what's happened in India. The biggest demonstrations of all time by the Indian farmers. And they won. They've won. Millions of people. They marched on Delhi. Uh, political people, not, not uh, <coughs> simply rural people following their leaders, all of them political people understood what they were doing and Modi has climbed down and and repealed these repressive laws that have been constricting uh, agriculture in India. Um, so th there's there's our inspiration. You know, uh, we've, we've, it's a, in a way it's giving up, it's giving up our liberal illusions. Oh gosh, there's got to be something good about the Guardian. No, there isn't. There is, there is nothing. I, you know what? I, there isn't. There really isn't. And 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 I believe in direct action. We should be going out in front of MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post. Uh, there'll be something here on. I got to get this in on a Monday at noon in front of the British consulate at 885 Second Avenue. There'll be a press conference and there'll be a bunch of demonstrators in support of Assange. So let that be the seed. We need everybody to go to the British consulate on Monday in their various countries and uh, then go to uh, various media outlets, go yeah. to the sidewalks. I believe in that. I went down to DC and for four days did a vigil in front of um, Department of Justice. Not that many people showed up, but you got to just keep trying. Uh, we, we have somebody I want to uh, go to. She's been waiting. Uh, she's a very good friend of Daniel, and she was recently on this show. She's been in the same book that you're in, uh, Julian Assange in defense of, and that is uh, stage director, uh, journalist Angela Richter. Uh, I know that you are heartbroken by uh, this uh, development today. Can you hear me okay, Angela? Angela. Yes. Um, hi, hi everyone. Hi, can you hear me? I, I have yes. somehow a bad connection, so I hope it holds. I'm in Croatia, you know, it's, it's the Balkans. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, yeah, like you said, I'm really devastated today. I don't know why, because I wasn't expecting actually something positive, but still it was devastating when I heard it, you know. And I really feel like it's what it's like watching uh, a car crash in slow mo. That's what Niels this morning said to me. You know, it's it's really like watching a car crash in slow motion, and then you don't know what to say. You know, it's it's. I I am very depressed today. So sorry, and um, I, I I'm afraid I would just repeat everything that you guys said already uh, before I came here. You know, commenting the case. The I think it's for me. It's it's really unbelievable, and um, that they can that there is something i mean it's a monstrous dysfunctionality of human rights what happens here you know because if it's possible that after the revelations of these yahoo news you know that the that the us was trying to uh, kidnap and kill julian while he was in london in the embassy i mean this should be the end of every trial in in if human rights exist. So today we saw they don't exist anymore. So yeah, it, it's just uh, unbelievable, you know, and I don't know 
I mean, you were just discussing direct action and so on. I'm I'm in for all kinds of things. I I I, I say yes to mainstream. I say yes to no stream. I say yes to everything. But the devastating fact is that most people don't seem to care. They they seem to have lost um, the ability for empathy, the ability for uh, to 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 um, go against injustice. You know. And what I also find devastating is to see how people can be um, mobilized once their own little um, freedoms are um, in danger. And, and this is only little freedoms, you know. I don't mind, you know, it's, it's like in the corona crisis now. I don't mind uh, to go somewhere with a mask for five minutes, you know. It's, it's, it's not a problem for me. For me, a problem is that Julian Assange is in... in, in in jail, you know, and so for me, it's it's very interesting to see how our capitalist society developed over the time that people don't have any empathy as long as they are not personally affected, they don't give a damn, you know, <laughs> and this is something which is very devastating. I know there is a lot of us, you know, people who think like us, but but what we would need now is really this big bang you know and i think 10 years ago it would have been possible to have that i would i think after the first revelations big revelations of wikileaks when when julian um, exposed the war crimes etc all these leaks from manning you know i think at that moment it would have been unstoppable but i think that this narrative of character assassination that's built up over the years it's it's really a clever and cunning thing to do you know okay that's very dark I, all, right. I just, all right well we're, we're, I, 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 i'm we not saying mind. let's give up but <laughs> I, i'm really in a bad mood sorry right yeah what i wanted to just on this i think angela is exactly right people care only about their own interests so let's explain to people that this is about them. You see, all of us, are, you know, uh, they need maybe, to feel it. You yes, know? because look, many of many of you, out. many of you are personal friends of Julian Assange. So this may sound strange to you, but an average person out there doesn't know him and probably doesn't like him without knowing him because they think to know things about him that are not true, but they have this prejudice against him as i had one in, in the beginning before you know i get into this case but so what i want to say is let's stop to try to convince people that this is you know is unfair to assange yes it is it's horrible what's being done to him but it is about them and their own interests and their future and their kids and their you know their ability to, to know the truth about what their governments are doing with their tax money and their own power that they have delegated to them. And what, 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 the, what, will ex, what they have to expect if they allow a world to be created before their eyes where it's a crime to tell the truth, where they're not allowed to ask questions because they will be regarded as conspirators in espionage, what you know what will the world look like and what will this world be doing to them and their children you know because they're they're not part of the elites 99 percent of the population is not part of the elites and once they realize that what that they're going to lose everything because they're not acting now then you'll get a movement you see right. because expecting empathy from everybody is is, is noble but it's not going to happen yeah, definitely. Um, we uh, have some time left. I, I want to uh, go to you, Stefani, as a journalist. Uh, remind people of the great contribution that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks has made uh, to the world of journalism. Well, they, they started the revolution, and uh, it is a revolution. I mean, I, we can you can see how crucial in, in, in information in the public interest and they have revealed they have revealed such an important series of things and, and you know about every country it's not just about the us it is about russia about uh, china it's about iran about every country so i mean no media organization have had 
such an impact. And no, no media organization was a, had been able to introduce such a revolutionary uh, system to change journalism. They, they really uh, open a gaping hole in this secret power, what I call the secret power, the power you cannot see in the you know, in the in the talk show, the power you cannot see. Um, it's not the power that decided about your schools or your health system, not directly, but indirectly, because they spend, it's the powers that make my country, for example, to fight in Afghanistan for 20 years when we didn't have the money to have decent schools or decent hospitals, you know? So they open a gaping goal in this secret power and never before, with the exception of Daniel Ellsberg and its Pentagon Papers, never before it, it had been possible. They made him it systematic, not just once in a while. They started the real revolution. That's why they want the US and actually all, all powers, as uh, Nils Melzer said, want to crush them. No one wants to see that dirty secret exposed. That's why, I mean, everyone want to want Julian Assange dead, you know, and WikiLeaks destroyed. That's why right. they want to That's leave. in your book. That's coming out. Uh, it's uh, where can people get that book? Well, it will take still a while because I'm litigating this bloody freedom of information case, and I'm I'm fighting against Scotland Yard and Crown Prosecution Service, the State Department. So I'm still fighting very hard, and I will put together all this FOIA litigation, all these documents to expose how corrupt completely corrupt. It's a massive scandal. It's a monstrous injustice, as Ken Lodge called it in the preface to my book. It's a massive scandal, this case. And I want to and I want to put together all these facts. There are something like 600 footnotes in my book to document everything. No one can say, well, there are no references. There are yeah. 600 footnotes to document everything. I expect libel cases that I have the documentation, you know? Right. And I have been fighting so hard to get this documentation. Completely known, there was not a single journalist. You know, you have to realize, not a single journalist in the world tried to get these documents. No one from the US, no one from the UK, no one from... Anyway, no one, you know, that's incredible. Yes. All right. You know, uh, I want to hear from uh, the three remaining guests here. Uh, Nils is back. And I'm going to say goodbye to the people at WBAI. Thank you uh, for carrying this. It's a, it's a news hour coming up. So they're, they're taken off. But the show continues. It's on everywhere. And uh, so I'm going to get a wrap up here from everybody. Um, let me begin. Uh, a couple of minutes from each individual. We'll start with you, uh, Angela, then we'll go with Roger, and then we'll go with Niels, and then we'll go with the great whistleblower of uh, the 20th century, Daniel Ellsberg. Right. Uh, Randy, can I just tell one thing to Roger? We need, uh, we need music. We need a language which speaks to everyone, to everybody. We need music, really, Roger. We need a language which is universal. Well, his music is fantastic. The news. People cannot get the news. Maybe they hate to read the newspaper. Maybe they hate the television. But people love music. That could help to mobilize people. He's yeah. been so <laughs> prolific. He's been so prolific. Let's go. Uh, yeah, have you heard the bar? We're going to play the bar later on. Uh, we're going to go to you, Angela. Just a, a wrap up. We're going to go around the horn here. Uh, and then we'll go to Roger and then. Niels and then uh, Daniel. Yes. Okay. I, I agree here with Stefania because being an artist myself, I do believe really that uh, art can be very powerful, especially music. I think it is the strongest thing. 
And in this case, and this goes also to Roger Waters, we need something on like another brick in the wall. It has to be that level of hit, you know? Yep. <laughs> that, I mean, it still blows my mind when I listen to it, you know? And, and I've had this feeling since I'm, I don't know, seven or something. <laughs> so yeah, no, we really need something strong, I think. And then I agree with Niels, you know, we, we somehow people have to feel threatened by what's happening to Julian. It's, it's definitely the case. So I think we just have to keep going because I, I remember when, when the piece came out by, by Niels and for the first time people really realized that the Swedish case is bullshit, you know, and uh, I'm sorry for the language, people. Well, but um, <laughs> we're off the air, uh, BAI. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I think that this was really a moment when, when at least most of the mainstream media just couldn't uh, keep up this narrative that they did for 10 years. So this was a very powerful moment. And, and I think, yeah, it was also very bad luck that, that the uh, pandemic happened and so on. People started caring about themselves even more. So it's, it's always also bad, bad luck, you know, in a way. But um, because we had this wave after this uh, thing came out and but, you know, we just have to keep going and everyone should use the tools that they have as strong as they can, because giving up and surrendering is no option, you know. Right. Roger, oh. uh, there are two people that are calling for more music from Roger Waters. Uh, and your music has, is, has for decades been a very powerful tool for change. Uh, wh what do you see? Why aren't there more musicians, songwriters, poets like yourself out there? Uh, with the same kind of passion and commitment. Well, you can use the F word now because we're no longer on WBAI. No, it's all right. You I, can I, use it. It's been, yeah. Um, how the fuck would I know? I mean, you'd have to ask them, wouldn't you? I've no, I've no idea. Trust me, that is a question that I stopped asking myself some time ago, having tried to engage fellow musicians in some of my other activities, political activities. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. I was really fascinated, though, by Niels's um, um, exp explaining about the illusioned and the disillusioned and how important that is for, for something to keep, you know, in the frontal lobes when thinking about this. Because I live in the United States of America, so I was also I was interested in what Daniel was saying in response to what John Pilger had been saying earlier about the First Amendment and arguments about whether or not Obama had this or that or the other and blah 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 and blah blah blah. blah. The fact is that American exceptionalism, um, explaining as it does so much to us about the capitalist and particularly neoliberal capitalist model and the way it is destroying the planet that we live on that we all live on but yeah. how, how how much that whole idea needs to be has to be exploded because i i, I mean i live here so I feel it all around me, and people look at you look at you as if you're completely insane when you say, "Well, the elephant in the room, ladies and gentlemen, is your feeling that you are exceptional in a way that is good." No, you're not. You're exceptional. Your country, United States of America, is very exceptional in a way that is appallingly bad. You're very powerful and you're very well armed and you go around the world murdering and plundering and raping and you think it's a great way to behave. You've been doing it for the last 400 fucking years. Well, it's not. And that is the elephant in the room. So, so but the, that is the, they are illusion. They believe they're great. They can't, you know, and it's very difficult to say something that's contrary. Why do you live there then? Why don't you fuck off back to England where you come from, you lanky prick? You know? <laughs> well, well, well I'm glad I got that's so my business. Well, right. let me tell you something. You should but take here, I want to go. Like, sorry, I hadn't well, finished quite. Love the illusion dissolution thing. Niels has gone. <laughs> oh, no, he's back. I love right. it. I think it's. Well, really listen, you should take that and put music behind it. I have. I've been trying to go on the road. 
for years now, but I can't because of COVID and people aren't allowed to gather in rooms and whatever. My tour, which I wrote or started writing three years ago, is called This Is Not A Drill. And in the title, it's all there, how I feel and what the whole new show that I was taking on the road is about is trying to disillusion people from the illusion that this is okay and that this is no this is not okay and this is not a drill and we are all in a slow car crash which again is an image that i like very much and 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 but you are witnessing it as bad weather and you know the old wildfire here or there in brisbane but actually, we're all dying a lot faster than is probably necessary because we have the illusion that this is okay, what's going on. Well, it isn't. And we have to become disillusioned with it, as Neil said. You, That's it. That's all I have to say. Neil, so it looks like you're concurring with yeah. uh, his assessment. Oh, 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 absolutely. And and also, I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely right. You know, this illusion of the empire is a good thing, you know, um, but also realizing that people living in those empires and, and by and large in the Western rich countries believe that they're actually benefiting from that. They don't, they don't see that they are part of the 99%. The populations, even in the rich countries are being exploited by their elites. You know, even they are being exploited, but they don't see that. And that's why I wrote this book to realize that this is, is about them. This, that's my way of trying, you know, we, we don't write books like, like this uh, as special rapporteurs all the time, but I felt this is the only way I can try to reach the broader public and explain to them through my story, how I had fooled myself into thinking that I'm part of a somehow just and functioning rule of law system. I'm not. And I had to dissociate myself from it and tell the truth about it first to myself, accept it, and then tell it through this book. And I invite people to join me on that journey from, you know, the, the, the shore of illusion through the river of truth, basically, to the shore of disillusion. It is painful, but it's also liberating because it, it gives you back your power that you can actually influence your world around you and what's happening. And what really is the truth is that 99% of the population is disempowered and doesn't even know about it. And this is what we, this is the truth. I mean, Julian Assange, you know, everybody's you know, believes he's a narcissist. It was never about him for himself. It was about the general public finding out the truth about what's really going on. So this is his work, and 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 this is our work as well. Everybody well, through his channels, music. I agree, music reaches your heart directly. It's another way of communicating to people. People will listen to you that will not listen to speeches, will not listen, read interviews, not read books. They will listen to music. Even if they don't realize it, it will go somehow unconsciously into their brains. So just as the destructive narratives have unconsciously entered our minds and you know created prejudices we're not even aware of, just the same way, positive messages can, uh, can enter our minds and we really should use those channels. Uh, well said. Uh, I want to go now. Uh, you talked about Julian Assange. He's not a popular figure. It's not like a Nelson Mandela uh, or even you, Daniel Ellsberg. You're, when you were uh, arrested and you were charged way back in 71, there was a huge movement. But of course, it came on the heels of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the anti-war movement. Uh, they all kind of dovetailed into where you were when you were charged. So what what, is that the difference, why you had so much support and Julian doesn't right now, because there's a dearth of uh, movements out here? Well, my disillusion began a few years before my first direct action, which was, as you point out, Randy, 50 years ago this year. The, uh, my first direct action was for the Pentagon Papers, which uh, put me on trial facing 
115 years in prison. For, on the same charges, Julian is now facing 175. So that's the difference. The, uh, there's a little inflation there. But there is another difference, which is that, um, as I keep saying, um, in our country, Julian is the first, and he's an Australian, not an American, but he's the first journalist to be tried and prosecuted and facing years in prison for putting out information. The, New York, the problem with the New York Times was if you start with Julian, how do you stop doing it from the New York Times, prosecuting him? And the answer is, you can't. So things can actually get worse. It occurs to me for the first time listening to all of you and realizing, let's see, aside from Randy, I think you and I are the only Americans here. I can't see how uh, British journalists can take seriously the illegal, unconstitutional aspects of prosecuting Julian because they've been subject to prosecution all their lives and they've come to accept That's it. That's irrelevant. What? Pardon me. I think it's completely irrelevant. Roger, you're, 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 full, of shit. you're okay. full of shit on that point. So let me uh, correct you. The fact is that journalists get uh, journalists get uh, arrested all the time, or not all the time, but have been arrested in Britain. So they're kind of used to it. Do you see a movement in Britain uh, against the Official Secrets Act? There should be. They should not have an Official Secrets Act of the kind they're all used to, and they do. So it occurs to me that what I've been doing for a long time is trying to keep my country from being as bad on this point as Britain. Now, in most cases, the American Revolution didn't create any uh, marvelous uh, utopia by any means. And really, there isn't that much different from the British democratic system, except on one point, the First Amendment. That's the point on which uh, there is a difference. And I didn't want us to go like Britain. And of course, most countries are worse. So there's something that uh, can actually get worse. Now, John made a good point, And Randy, I'm sorry he's not here now, but will you pass on to him? My thanks for reminding me the direct action against the media, putting them on account of their uh, shortcomings and their um, uh, not moving uh, on these things, and their being part of the imperial system, our media did not protect us from Vietnam. It did not protect us from aggression in Iraq. And by the way, neither did the British media, of course. Uh, they joined us in both of those aggressions. So. The fact is that we did civil disobedience. As I say, I joined a movement of civil disobedience. We did it uh, against the executive largely and uh, with some help from the media. We didn't do it on the media ever. And that's a good idea. Uh, Sit-ins there, protests, missions and whatnot is a good idea. Mil Nils, uh, I want to recommend to people, your book hasn't come out yet, but I have read it and I very much recommend people reading it, even to those of us on the screen who uh, have, um, uh, think we know about Assange, we've been following it all this time. But the fact is that your book is extremely illuminating and very impressive, very unusual as a member of the establishment, I think I may say, as a UN rapporteur here, who changed his mind and saw some, you know, changed his mind. It's an impressive uh, personal document on that. So thank you for it, and I recommend other people reading it. As far as I was really impressed by Angela's point, maybe she's left here, that the problem is that the public doesn't show the concern when they do hear the facts that we wish they did. I don't foresee a movement, frankly, in favor of the First Amendment. Here, people don't know any, any more about it here than they do in Britain. How do I know about it? It's the one part of the law that I know about because I was the first person prosecuted under. So I know 18 U.S.C. 793 paragraphs D and E, which is what, uh, what uh, Julian is charged with, because I was charged with it. And now it's getting even worse. And that's the last point I want to make here, is that, yes, I agree with everything everyone has said here on criticism of the American empire. And uh, I think we all agree on the British empire and a lot of other imperialists. But to think that's it, it can't get any worse, so there's nothing to do but in the streets. The courts don't matter, the media don't matter, Congress doesn't matter. It can get worse, and here's the sad fact. It's going to get worse. 
Right. We're looking right now, if people think that there's no difference between Biden, Biden, as I say, is even worse on this point than Obama. If they think there's no difference between whoever succeeds Biden and Trump, they're going to learn differently. So uh, we, Trump is not a favor for 2024. To think that electoral politics has no part in this in preventing Trump is very foolish. How about direct action? After my first one, I've been arrested almost 90 times. I'm 99, but I'm very, very close to 90 arrests. So I believe in that. Absolutely. I got arrested in front of the White House for Chelsea Manning, uh, her isolation, and at Quantico, where she was being held in isolation. And that, by the way, actually worked. We got her out of isolation. The same thing with Julian. I think uh, there there is a case where we might get people concerned about his actual condition. But as, as everybody's been saying here, Nils and Rudy, but they hate him, so they're not going to do this. But John's point is, and Nils' point, when people see that the target is on their backs, that they're going to think, I don't think you can get the general public concerned about that. I'm sorry to say. I've been trying for half a century, and I have to say, I don't see that coming. But for the first time, journalists can get excited. Not for me. They told me, believe me, uh, it didn't happen then, and it didn't happen for any of the other couple dozen people who've come along, because the journalists thought, oh, those are just sources. That's not me. Uh, they think of sources as snitches and informants, and they don't give a shit about their sources. I wow. can tell you that. But the uh, but in turn, when they, when they are faced with prosecution themselves, as I've been trying to convince them for 50 years, they will be, but they weren't, so they didn't get excited. Now they are subject to prosecution. That gives us a chance for actually getting them excited. And I'll do the best I can. Right. Uh, that's where, very well said, uh, Daniel. Uh, look, uh, we just have a few minutes. I, I, we're going to play. You talked about Rogers. We're going to go out. I mean, please cue that up, Kelly. Uh, the bar, uh, a piece of the bar, an excerpt of the bar uh, that uh, has a nice little slideshow to it. Uh, that Roger gave us a few months back, um, and we played it. And the next time, Nils will be playing uh, the uh, Moonlight Sonata, but we're going to play this protest song. We're going to go out with the bar by Roger Waters, and you can see the whole thing at Live on the Fly. You can see the whole, with lyrics. Roger even helped us get the lyrics put on the screen. So it's an incredible piece of music. I'll send it around to everybody. Uh, Stefania, before we play that, uh, any last words from you before we go out with the bar? Yes, we don't have all the time ahead. We we really have to we really have to act. We really have to mobilize people to take the street because uh, there's not much time left for Julian. I believe there is not much time left for Julian. So I mean. We really have to push hard to make people to mobilize and to take the streets because the legal system will not save we will not protect him of course i mean the legal system has crashed him so all we have all is left is the political action the, the public pressure people taking the street to the streets yes I, yeah, I, before we go because we've been talking about this legal this Kafka-esque uh, trial. I, I, I've been wanting to play this for everybody here. It's about a minute and a half. This is William Kunzer, my godfather. Him after the Chicago uh, 8 trial, uh, him coming out and really summarizing. This is from the documentary by his kids. Um, uh, it's called uh, Disturbing the Universe. Now, just listen to this little bit. Can you uh, cue that up, Kelly? You got that? This is that, William Kunzer. That's Kunstler a terrible right myth of organized society, that everything that's done through the established system is legal. And that word has a powerful psychological impact. It makes people believe that there is an order to life and an order to a system. And that a person that goes through this order and is convicted has gotten all that is due him. And therefore, society can turn its conscience off and look to other things and other times. And that's the terrible thing about these past trials, is that they have this aura of legitimacy. 
this aura of legality. I suspect that better men than the world has known, and more of them, have gone to their death through a legal system than through all the illegalities in the history of man. Six million people in Europe during the Third Reich, legal. Sacco Vanzetti, quite legal. The Haymarket defendants, legal. The hundreds of rape trials throughout the South, where black men were condemned to death, all legal. Jesus, legal. Socrates, legal. And that is the kaleidoscopic nature of what we live through here and in other places. Because all tyrants learn that it is far better to do this thing through some semblance of legality than to do it without that pretense. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? <laughs> Pretty moving. Uh, that's from Disturbing the Universe uh, by Emily and Sarah Kuntzville. So. Well, basically, we need Tim to come back, right? <laughs> No, but I, I get your point. It's it's really right. very powerful. That's what Julian is going through right now. That's what's happening to Julian, what happened to Donziger, what happened to our uh, friend Craig Murray. Uh, they went through a legal system, a BS legal system. The counselor is referring to them, uh, basically, right? I'm predicting what was happening today. Uh, Roger, was that not nice? You got to see that documentary, Disturbing the Universe. I'll send you a link. I want to see it. All right. Um, and I want to thank... Stefani Morizzi, for all your great work, all of your wonderful, brave, heroic work uh, in, in the, la the last 12 years that I've, I've seen it uh, with, with WikiLeaks. I know it goes way back. Uh, and you, uh, Nils, uh, I'm looking forward to your book, as I am Stefania's. Uh, it's called The Trial of Julian Assange. I, I got a copy of it. I read it. It is a must read. Let's get one over to Daniel. If, oh, he's read it. Right. Daniel's already read it, so he knows. Angela, get Angela a copy. Thank you for all your great work and, and your passion. Roger, you know, I love you. And That's it's not great. just because you got, you love dogs. You know, I lost my dog this week. This was a very difficult one. Uh, so thank you all for being part of this today. And I want to thank Kelly Lang uh, and you, Daniel. Man, you are an inspiration. All you are. And, uh, Roger, let me say what you said about the elephant in the room. Couldn't be better said. I applaud it. I agree. Thanks for saying it. Get it out as much as possible. That's what I'm trying to do. All right. All right. We're going to go out with the bar now, folks. Um, we'll see you next time here uh, on the Sanch Countdown to Freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly Lane. You did a marvelous job. Our first time using this system. Fabulous. Thanks, I love you all. Good night. Thank you very much. Does everybody in the bar feel shaky? Lord knows I do. I guess we all feel pretty much the same. Kind of wore out by this crazy fucking soul. The smell of napalm with the cornflakes. The chafe of killing everything that breathes. Imposing sanctions on the lady down the street. So she takes the in and packs her bags and leaves. Come on in here, sister, and set a spell. 
You are most welcome. In the bar. We may seem few, but we are many. Have you been traveling for the girl who brought you in here? Is Lakota from Standing Rock, where they made the stand? So from Fort Yates, North Dakota, here's a message for the man. Would you kindly get the fuck off our land? That's all she wrote. Good night, everybody. <laughs>